So welcome, and, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so let's begin. So my name is Miguel Ibanez Aristondo. Uh, I'm an assistant professor here at Villanova University, and I'll be hosting this event today along with Lowell Gustafson, who is a professor of political science in the political science department here also at Villanova University. So to give some information about the event, so first David will be like giving like a talk about, about the mon monumentalization of Christopher Columbus in the Americas, more historical talk about, to give us some context about, about uh, this figure and its legacies in the Americas and in, in particular in Mexico, the Dominican Republic and the US. And then we, ha we will have more a conversation that will be moderated by me and Lowell Gustafson. So you can either, if you have questions, you can start by maybe writing if you want in the chat or, or anticipating the questions. So we can just let for the conversation after the talk, okay? So I'm gonna present David before we start, okay? So first, and before I forget, so the event is sponsored by the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures at Villanova University, and also the Latin American Studies Program and the Political Science Program. So I wanna thank you for the force, for the sponsorship of this event. Um, and now I will introduce the speaker. So David, it is a great pleasure to have you here. I'm very happy that you, you had the time to, to give this talk today. So David Horacio Colmenares is an assistant professor of colonial Latin American studies at Boston University. He's a specialist in early modern Iberian antiquarism, Mesoamerican studies, and visual and material cultural studies of the colonial period. And David research, and uh, let me just, Sorry, I'm gonna, okay. David's research focuses on the intersections of early modern Iberian and Mesoamerican study, and he's also currently working on a second project that focuses on the reinvention of colonial imaginaries in the 19th century in Mexico. And today, as I told you before, David will be speaking about the monumentalization of Christopher Columbus in the US, Mexico, and the Dominican Republic. And he will provide different contexts from the 19th and 20th centuries to anticipate about, about com uh, our conversation later. Okay, so thank you, David, for joining us today and for like offering this talk. Thank you very much. You can now begin. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Professor Ibanez and, uh, and Professor Gustafsson for this invitation. I'm uh, I'm thrilled to be to be speaking with you on this very date on a very timely um, uh, date and also moment. No, so um, I would like to to offer some remarks that I've organized around particular case studies in the way that we have monumentalized the figure of Christopher Columbus throughout the Americas. So let me begin by saying that. Um, even though it has become a, 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 state, a standard um, idea uh, to correlate monuments and memory, I would like to, to begin by saying that I think we're at a, at a juncture in which this connection between memory and mon monumentalization can uh, begin to be uh, unmade. I think it's especially relevant in the case of figures connected to Iberian expansion to the Americas uh, to think of monuments not so much as sites of memory or sites of, of uh, memorialization, but rather sites of uh, negotiation and, and uh, sites where very different uh, claims over the past and very different uh, identities and narratives come together and find what can only be considered partial solutions. And for me, this is a key idea of beginning to think of monuments as partial and in that sense, unstable solutions that reflect a peculiar equilibrium of forces in certain moments, in certain uh, very concrete junctions, rather than let's say expressions of, of grander coherent ideologies, uh, especially 
uh, ideologies that, that we tend to associate with imperial uh, expansion or nation building. So in this sense, I think uh, the figure of Columbus offers a very uh, interesting and perhaps paradigmatic case insofar as, as I'll try to show today, he's been a figure that has almost become a bit of an empty signifier, a figure that can be adapted and reclaimed by a very by a, by a wide variety of agents and purposes and historical junctures. So, um, so let me begin by, by speaking a little bit about the way that I will organize this talk, I will begin, uh, I will uh, present to you three or four cases, according how much time we have, uh, two, three or four cases in which Columbus has been memorialized throughout the continent, especially in the 19th century and onwards. And I think here, I think it's very important to note that the monumentalization, and in fact, the very notion of, of Columbus as a important historical agent is really closely tied to the 19th century. Um, in earlier periods, if we go back to, to, the, to, the, to the 16th or 17th century and even later, Columbus is a bit of a contested and fraught figure. And it's really in the 19th century that he emerges as, as this uh, paradigmatic uh, uh, character in, in, in the confirmation of, of the Americas. So just to give you a sense of this, we, we lack, of course, any, any contemporary portraits of Columbus, even though this one from 1519 is generally considered uh, 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 a portrait of, of the Ligurian uh, navigator, as the title claims. But if we were to search for, let's say, something that gave us a sense of how Columbus himself look at, uh, uh, presented himself or conceived of himself, we perhaps would have to resort to his signature, uh, which as many of you might know, uh, 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 means Christopherens, no? or the Porter of Christ, and, and is an identity that he uh, really affirmed in the later part of his, of his days. So, so this is this is the only uh, let's say idea we have of how he might have conceived of himself. Of himself. So, in order to to reach the, the 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 kind of historical figure that we now conceive as as the Almirant, we would have to wait till 1828 when Washington Irving, by then the most important uh, North American novelist and writer wrote what is generally regarded as the first modern biography of Columbus that surprisingly enough did not emerge in 19th century Spain or anywhere in the Hispanic Americas, but rather in, um, in the US. This book was <clears throat> extremely influential in crystallizing a first modern view of Columbus very connected to American nation consolidation, let's say, as, as a figure that in a way provided for uh, an epic backdrop to, 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 American, uh, to the American uh, Republic or nation. In, in, in Washington Irving's telling, Columbus emerges as a figure uh, that is at the one, on the one hand, uh, an enterprising individual, no? someone who is a visionary and a self-reliant uh, individual that is, easily, is easy to, the, the, um, to extricate, let's say, from the backdrop of Hispanic or Iberian uh, imperialism, but also from the kind of violence that was associated to the conquerors. And Washington Irving famously wrote that the figure of, 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 of Columbus was quite different from what he called the dissolute rabble of white men who composed you know, the, the rank and file of, of, Amer of Spanish imperialism. So in this 
in this book, I think Irving really creates sort of this epic discourse around discovery. But, and very crucially, in my mind, he, dis he uh, extracts a figure of Iberian expansion and reclaims it for North American history you know, as a foundational moment that at the same time, in, in a way, effaces the Iberian or even the Hispanic aspects of, of the, let's say, the discovery of the Americas. So I think it's really with Irving that an, uh, a Pan-American image of Columbus emerges. Then we will have to wait at least 50, 50 years before the first urban discourses around the monumentalization of Columbus arise. And one of the early, earliest examples is, found, is, is to be found in, in Mexico City, no? in, in what is today the Paseo de la Reforma. And in 1887, a uh, very important liberal historian, Vicente Riva Palacio, propounded the erection of this monument that in the end came from, from Paris and was dispatched by a, a Mexican emigre, Antonio de Escandón, but really at the behest of Riva Palacio, who was a historian very close to the Porfirian regime and very engaged in a historiographical project of uh, laying out the, let's say, the foundations for the liberal state in, 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 in 20, uh, 19th century Mexico. The interesting thing with this monument is that for, for, for Riva Palacio, and let me show you the next, it actually formed part of a larger discourse, no? a larger frame that actually takes the shape of the Paseo de la Reforma, no? one of the central avenues in Mexico City. And in a way, it offered um, a counterpoint to what was to become the greatest monument of Porfirian Mexico, which is a monument of Cuauhtémoc that still stands to this day in, in, at, at, the, at the, an important juncture of Paseo de la Reforma. So Columbus here arises or appears as a counterpart to this great uh, Mexican Tlatuani. And if one reads you know, the, 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 the journal articles and the newspaper articles of the, of the age, it's clear that for Riva Palacio, Columbus offered a series of things. It allowed him to extol a kind of European or universal, let's say, um, a legacy, while at the same time creating some sense of distance with uh, Hispanic uh, imperialism and with Spain. Uh, Riva Palacio famously explored the uh, archives of the Inquisition in his own literature in order to, to, to bring down the kind of, of tyranny and, and, and sort of uh, oscurantist violence of, of the Catholic monarchy. So by, by, by propounding the monumentalization of Columbus, he was in many ways finding a figure of compromise, no? a figure connected to a wider Mediterranean legacy, while at the same time uh, not being necessarily a figure of Spanish uh, expansion or, or imperialist ideology. He appeared as a visionary, as a genius, much to the taste of the 19th century, and a figure that could be opposed again, as, as in Washington Irving, to the general oscurantist backdrop of, of Spain and its institutions, such as the Inquisition. I, what I find very interesting about this, this um, monumental um, discourse is that for this generation of liberal historians, there was no contradiction between the figure of Columbus and the figure of the last Mexica Tlatuani. No? And in fact, the whole, the whole uh, Paseo de la Reforma can be read as a historiographical intervention of this sort. So it's very interesting to, to I, I, I need to say that, um, that, and this is very relevant, that this monument of Columbus was, um, or one of them in Paseo de la Reforma was, was brought down 
uh, as of last night by the authorities of Mexico City for very uh, perplexing reasons. They, they claim that it's been brought down to be restored, even though it seems that they were that what were, they were really doing is preventing uh, the activists that had vowed to tear down the monument today. So as of this morning, the monument no longer stands. So let me move, move on to talk a little bit more about the monument that perhaps we tend to associate more strongly with Columbus in the US, which is the Columbus Monument in, in, in New York in Manhattan. This monument was erected in 1892, so 20 or so years after the Mexico City Columbus. And, but here we, have a, we find a completely different set of agents and, and uh, vindications. In this case, the monument, as many of you know, I'm sure, was propounded or was uh, promoted by a group of Italo-American uh, businessmen. So it was mostly Italo-American businessmen from New York that took to the most important Italian newspaper of the age, no? Il Progresso, Italo-Americano, uh, 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 a newspaper that was printed in Italian, to invite the Italian-American community to contribute for, to the erection of a number of, of monuments, uh, among which we find the Columbus Monument. This group of, of people Wanted, wanted to, to, to create monuments to Verdi, to Dante, to Garibaldi, and also, and I find this very interesting, of er, to, to early Italian explorers of North America. No? But in the end, it was really Columbus, the figures of, figure of Columbus, who really galvanized this interest and um, eventually led to the construction of this grand monument, which, by the way, and I think this is very crucial for our conversation, was uh, funded by subscription. And a colleague of mine here in Boston University, uh, in, a, in a conversation a couple of weeks ago, told me that, in fact, most uh, monuments in the US were built through subscription. And I think that adds a very interesting layer you know, to, the, to the way that we tend to think of of monuments as expressing some kind of state ideology or imperial ideology, etc. Whereas in the case of uh, at least this monument, and as we shall see the next monument that I'll talk about, it was largely uh, private contributions that made this monument possible. Uh, the monument was, I mean, this this might be perhaps more, more familiar to you, but uh, there's two things I think are worth remarking about this. The first one is that in the immediate context, the Monument of Columbus was really a way for the Italo-American community to, to um, acquire or to defend a sense of prestige, of cultural prestige in the day, in a, in a day and time when, when uh, discrimination fell, uh, largely within the Italo-American community, and they were subjected to the kind of police violence that we tend to, to, uh, to, to reflect on in the current day. And so it was a way of you know, uh, showing, showcasing the, the, the cultural legitimacy of this community. At the same time, and, I, I, and this is more of a work in progress uh, idea, uh, I think especially in El, in El Progreso, one has a sense that the creation of this monument really participated in the process of Risorgimento, no? of Italian, uh, of Italian, um, sorry, uh, unification, and the process of, of Italian unification that only ended in the 19, in the 18, in 1918, sorry. And um, so, by creating this sort of supra-regional ident Italian identity, I think Il Progreso and the Italo-American uh, communities around the erection of these monuments were also contributing to this wider sort of Italian dias diaspora uh, construction of, of a nation. So let me just continue to the next uh, case. As I, I would just mention that 
in in researching for this doing research for this topic i found that during the same years in new york there was an alternative for an for another colombian uh, monument in new york this time it was proposed by hispanic uh, americans no spanish americans rather and it was actually promoted by the consul of spain and the consul of, of mexico and this project was actually was quite interesting because it was a fountain to be placed on the other side of Central Park, so though really composing some kind of a of a, of a double monument, never never came to fruition. But the plans there's there's a, a long article in Harper's Magazine about it, and and you can see how another immigrant community in New York was also reclaiming the Colombian legacy no? as part of their identity. So let me move on to my next example my next case and this is the perhaps the less familiar case for for all of us um, it's based in the republic in the dominican republic and it's a fascinating and quite bizarre monument i have to say uh, it is called the faro de colon no the colombian lighthouse and its creation took over a century it was first proposed around the beginning of the of the 20th century by a Dominican historian. Then it was taken up by by uh, the first no, I, I think it was actually the um, uh, one, mo one moment. We have time. Yeah, I was <clears throat> part of the first one of the early um, Pan-American conferences held in Santiago de Chile in 1923. And in this conference, not only Latin American republics participated, but also crucially, the United States. So by 1930, there was already a plan uh, or, or an, and actually a competition for the design of this monument. And an intriguing little fact is that Frank Lloyd Wright took took part of this uh, this this jo this uh, group of people who 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 selected the, the monument and it began to be to be built and it was only finished in the nineteen in nineteen ninety two. So what I find very really fascinating about this this document is that here you can see it in action and and, and represented in 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 various formats from throughout the continent, like a, a, a Argentinian a stamp and, and, and a publication, etc., is that this monument was originally meant to be a lighthouse, but it's actually shaped as a basilica. So it really became a basilica and a church. And it, it houses today, as, as some of you might know, the, the, the questionable remains of Columbus in the, Republican, in the Dominican Republic. And it was meant to represent a symbol of, of course, you know, a lighthouse of, of orientation and, and guidance. At the same time, um, it really inserted Columbus as within a figure closer to his own view of himself as, as, a, bring, as, 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 a, as a figure who brought Christianity to the Americas and was thus you know, shedding light like a lighthouse. And what I find uh, most interesting, perhaps, is that it's a moment, it's a very interesting moment in the creation of a kind of Pan-American Pan -American, um, unity, both cultural and politically. Of course, this, this, this unity never came to fruition. No, There was a proposed League of American Nations that would bridge cultural and political differences between the US and Latin American republics. Uh, and this never happened, no? So this, this is a failed, in many ways, a failed uh, attempt at a Pan-American unity. And yet the lighthouse was built and remains to this day, no? A testimony to this very early sense of uh, Pan-Americanism. So here again, we see the figure of Columbus acquiring a different shape, no? Columbus as a Pan-American figure that is equally representative of North America and South America or, or Latin America, and that 
under the umbrella of uh, the, the, the bearer of Christianity can really represent people, peoples from across the continent. So I'll, I'll, I'll um, show you the last case that I, that I brought to you today. And this is an event that took place um, almost around the same dates as, the, as the, the lighthouse was being inaugurated in the Dominican Republic. And this event took place in the Mexican state of, San Crist of Chiapas, in the city of San Cristobal de las Casas. For anyone familiar with recent Mexican history, you would note that the dates are scarcely two years before the Neo-Zapatist rebellion in, in Chiapas. So in many ways, it is an event that foreshadows and sends a signal about what it is what was about to come. And in this case, we have a group of indigenous people in, in San Cristobal tearing down the figure of Masariegos, no, a Spanish con conquistador of, uh, of this region of southern Mexico. And um, in, a, in a very interesting twist, no, this, this sort of overthrowing of a Spanish conquistador as an announcement of, let's say, the, the political agency to come no, through the rebellion of indigenous peoples in southern Mexico, the, the, the Colombian uh, imaginary once again appears but this time as the bot literally of a joke. And let me, let me show you this picture mm -hmm. for you, uh, for anyone who knows a little bit of Spanish, they, they might, might understand the, the joke. But in any case, I, th I find, I find this, this moment also very intriguing and very, very suggestive of the way that, to conclude, no, I would say monuments and, and uh, uh, sculptures in public space in the Americas are not only, I, I, I would say, the expression of a coherent so, and, 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 and unified ideology, but also spaces of constant renegotiation. No? And insofar as these negotiations and equilibrium are by, by their very nature provisional, what the question I would like to open our conversation today with is what do we do uh, after these monuments uh, are brought down? No? What, what do we do with these monuments that are in themselves since the beginning completely unstable? And uh, I would like to, to end here. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Was it very... Muchas gracias. Estaba muy bien. So yeah, so now we can open the conversation and uh, I think this was a very good question, right? Like uh, the different cases that you saw like throughout the, all this history from the 19th century up until today and up until the 1992, right? That it is like, a, we can say the last moment in which there is this renewal of of uh, what is the image of Christopher Columbus and now we have a a, a current and different context in which uh, uh, the figure reappears and uh, is part or central part of the conversations about different questions that you have raised so it was very good so I don't know if uh, someone want to ask something or have a comment about maybe questions that David or to me or Lowell. Well, first of all, let me just jump in if, if I could and, and yeah. thank David for a really excellent uh, presentation and a really interesting one. And I, I think that your uh, idea that we should think of these monuments as being partial, uh, participants in a process of negotiation is really great. Um, and that the Mexicans were a century ahead of us uh, on, on that idea with the positive reformer. I think it's wonderful. And I just hadn't really thought uh, uh, through that, that, that there you had uh, Columbus in conversation with Watermark and, uh, and, and to uh, 
there should be a great mestizo figure in there as, as, as well. But uh, that, okay. I, I, I'm a little sorry that uh, Columbus is now removed from that conversation. Um, it, it strikes me as a that's that's the that's the the right approach to take, uh, which is the, is the one that they they were doing. So, um, I, I think your observations are really interesting on how we here in the United States, starting with Washington Irving, kind of appropriated Columbus as the beginning point of a, of the origin story of our republic, that he's self-reliant, uh, that he's innovative, that he's a, a modern thinker. He's, he's the one who knows the earth is round and it's those silly Spaniards who thought it was flat, you know. Um, uh, he's, the, he's the beginning of the, of the American project uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, the rejection of the European one. I, I think that's a fascinating uh, uh, view of, of uh, Columbus's role here in the American national identity. Um, but I, I'm, I'm wondering how we can pursue your idea of monuments, taking them off of pedestals and putting them into negotiated conversations. Uh, physically, is there a way to do that at this point? Um, or is, is that asking a lot uh, for, for the level of political discourse that we have these days? Mm. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lowell. Th yeah, that's a wonderful uh, question. And thank you very much for your comment. Uh, I agree. It seems that uh, the moment of, let's say, reassembly no, of monuments has passed. And we are clearly, I think, in a moment, maybe maybe two year, two or three years ago, when, when protests throughout North America really uh, question the presence of these monuments. Maybe that was that was a, a, a still a time where, where these kinds of new renegotiations or new sculptural ensembles could have been made, right? But I, I do agree with you if I if I read you correctly that it seems that that moment is past. It seems that there is um, an overwhelming popular push to remove this docu this this monument from from urban space at least from public space but um, but i agree I, I think it's an open question what do we do what are we do where, what are we going to do with the empty pedestals let's say no and i think um, just to to provide another sort of mexican uh, recent event as a possible response the 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 authorities in Mexico City said that they were going to remove the Colum Columbus monument to so that it could be cleaned and, and restored. But also they say something I think was quite interesting. They say that they were going to take that opportunity to start a conversation around what to do with this monument. No, so I find this a, a, a an interesting solution. No, preventing. The, the simple, let's say, tear, tearing down of the monument and rather bracketing for a time and opening up a conversation whose the, the, the solution of which uh, I think it's unforeseeable. But, but uh, yeah, that's, that's a, a question I, I very much ask myself. Yeah, Mercedes, I think. Uh, I, uh, let me just unmute your, okay, now, yeah. Um, no. <clears throat> okay, first of all, I wanna thank you, the, uh, David, for your presentation. Very, very interesting because it gave us a historical uh, perspective on, on how the statues were built here in this uh, continent. And it had very little to do with Spain, but a lot to do with what people here in this continent were trying to, to do. I mean, in the case of Mexico, we'll create a history for them, you know, and, um, and so on. Um, I'm questioning, okay, so uh, what is happening here with the statues comes a little later than what happened with history, with the study of history, because history was also, it used to be uh, the story of the, uh, empires, the people dominating, the powerful, and now history is open to every other aspect of uh, society. 
uh, the, the ones who lost, the ones that, that are marginalized, the, everybody is part of that history. And it seems to me that maybe eventually, I don't know, I would like to think that we could have more monuments, not just instead of tearing down these ones, bring others up to commemorate other people that were missed, were forgotten, and that were also part of the history. And it seems to me that would be a great solution for this, rather than tearing down the past history, adding to it to, to see it all in much, uh, much more completely. I don't know, that's my idea, but what do you think of that? Thank you very much, Mercedes. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the 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 empty pedestal is a great opportunity no? for reassessing our own uh, relation to the past. And what troubles me, I, have, I must say, is that I, I see again and again this opportunity being missed. No? I think there is a great tendency to remove the, the monuments and then there's uh, very little interest in, 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 in reflecting about the past after that. And what often happens is that the space left out, uh, left by the by the by the crumbling monument, it's taken by the most revisionist and often questionable uh, historical or, or pseudo historical approaches, right? From from very very nationalist or xenophobic uh, agents. So so again, I think. I agree with you that it, 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 we have to find ways to sort of pursue the matter further and and really seize the the, the opportunity that this this moment brings about for our thinking about the past and um, and here I think maybe it's also a, a question of the kinds of things that fall outside of the purview of professional experts on the past, no? like historians and academics, but rather other types of, of, uh, of uh, politi political and uh, historical agents. And I often think that artists, for instance, have a great, um, a, a great, uh, have, 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 have great contributions to, 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 to do on, on how we can invent new ways of dealing with the past. Yes. But I, I, I was thinking of the same thing, you know, the mm -hmm. artists uh, who have contributed so much to history as well, and to Absolutely. our and to our development um, as humans, I think they need to be somehow uh, given credit, uh, and it could be done in that way as well. Yeah, and this is, I think, a very good it's point. It's controversial. It's all right. Yeah, I think it was a very good point, Mercedes, and I think it reflects one of the uh, questions that we have today about, about presentism and about how history understood with the capital letter as a sort of discipline explaining, as you were saying, right, about the Western domination. So how probably we, at this moment, there are two things at least that I can relate to that. One is that we are, as in one of the interpretations that some historians did, like Francois Artaud, that people like this, that think that we are in a moment of presentism in which we focus more on memory than on history, on museums, memorializations, and we have these struggles about how, not about trying to create a sort of like a rationale about the past, but more about how we experience in more emotional, political, and social terms, what is the past? And on the other hand, I think it's also important to think about how this uh, reflects on a crisis, right, of Western values. And, uh, and David was explaining very well what is uh, Christopher Columbus, among other many different things, I think is a figure that has multiple meanings in different contexts and is always I like like uh, one of the terms that David used at the beginning, which is this idea of is always a parcel. So it was a parcel solution in the 19th century. It was a compromise. It was never something that everyone was buying, right? This figure it was, but now it's kind of it's 
the problem is now in the present, I think is not a compromise, it's more a sort of a problem in the public space, right? So this is a, another good point. I'm gonna uh, also like uh, give the, uh, the floor uh, to Carlos Garriga, is one of my students. I think you're gonna tell something, right, Carlos? Uh, yes. Yeah, so Carlos uh, is thank, taking my class. So, for the, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Thank you, um, David, yeah. for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I enjoyed it. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question. I, I am from uh, Puerto Rico, and uh, the biggest statue in the Western Hemisphere is a 300 meter, no, it's a 280 foot tall Columbus statue. Um, it's about two hours from where I live. And also another uh, aspect I wanted to bring is that our our anthem in one of the most important verses is talks about Colón and how he kind of discovered us and I wanted to ask you about how mm -hmm. would you um, like how would the, the kind of the existence of that monument and the kind of history behind our five more than 500 year colonization period that still exists today Mm -hmm. Would you still have the same opinion of kind of um, maintaining that symbol of kind of dominance over our country, yeah. even if someday in the future our colonial period is over? Or would it be better to add to our history and kind of still have this incredibly large statue yeah. in our uh, thank you very much Carlos that's a that's a wonderful reflection and and it's really intriguing that it's that in the Caribbean you have this this series of monuments that almost in a way defy I mean of course they clearly were trying to defy the 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 passage of time right but I think in an unexpected turn of events they also defy the activities of 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 people wanting to to bring them down no they're in a way monuments that uh, to my mind they resemble more the type of hubris of an egyptian pyramid right there's a there's a monument for eternity in a way uh, the the basilica lighthouse in santo domingo it's absolutely massive there's no way you could no you could you could uh you could destroy that without in case with with a sculpt the, the monumental sculpture you you define you 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 mention in, in Puerto Rico. And it makes me think, among other things, the type of view that 19th century Caribbean historians have about the role of Caribbean nations in the colonization of the Americas and within again this framework of an emerging Pan-Americanism, no? So that's one thing. As to the future of that, I, I agree. I mean, it seems that that these monuments were created to defy the passage of time, the change of political trends, and and it, it, it is a really great question: what to do with uh, with 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 uh, monuments of that scale? No? So so thank you very much. And if you have a more more ideas about it that would be wonderful to to hear to hear about thank you it was like there's also uh miguel i just saw there's a, a few uh, comments in the chat yeah uh, it was i think uh, the first one was uh, Mikel. Right. i think mm -hmm. maybe you can comment on, on, on yeah. uh, jacinto verdaguer right yeah verdaguer yeah well, verdaguer. yeah basically what i was mentioning is that there is a point that was written at the end of the 19th century, was written by this Catalonian poet, Jacinto Verdaguer, and is connected with what you were exposing about the representation of Colón in the national spaces, urban spaces, around the second half of the 19th century. And I, it, it comes to my mind that it could be something that may be useful for your, for your research. So that's why it was just, I mean, it was not anything else. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's giving a of Cologne, like we, I think, have a Mikkel. 
problem with your Cristóbal Colón the mm -hmm. of the Atlantic or something like that. It's just a representation about yeah. Colón. And... No, that's that's fascinating. I didn't know about this specific poem, but I I I it, it's it's fair to say that in uh, Spanish epic poetry, yeah. Yeah, Columbus just, first yeah, mm -hmm. yeah plays a very important role. And there's no there's of course epic poems about Columbus in in Spanish, in Latin, in Italian, and that yeah. is a bit of a different genealogy. I agree, but it's certainly part of this uh, of this construction. Thank you very much. Yeah, no but, yeah but, but following following Mikel's question, I think, yeah, we didn't speak about, about Spain, but it's, it's a very, in a certain way, different context, but all the statues that we have in Spain is exactly the same moment than we have in Mexico, the US, or, or the Caribbean islands and nations. So we have uh, the status in Madrid and Barcelona, Usually, uh, most part of them are also at the end of the 19th century. This is like a new monumentalization, which is in Spain very particular because it's the moment when it was as after the first like uh, moment of independence in Cuba and the Caribbean islands, and it's just before uh, the uh, the moment of the regeneracionismo and the crisis of. Uh, this imperial identity, right? This is the first moment in which in Spain, uh, intellectuals and from the perspective also of institutions, they, they, they face this idea of not uh, having a new perspective about this imperial past, right? So, so this was a moment also of the fourth centenary of uh, Christopher Columbus with, with exhibitions uh, universal exhibitions everywhere in Madrid, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So this was a very important moment. It was a very big conversation. Uh, as you were saying that uh, the question of Pan-Americanism and about the identity and uh, many intellectuals of, uh, of, I didn't know the example that Mikel was uh, bringing here the Verdaguer, but there are many Spanish intellectuals in dialogue with other historians from Mexico, Cuba, and speaking also about all the uh, questions about more the identity in terms of like the Hispanidad, right? The Hispanidad, El Dia de la Raza. We know that this is how the day today, Columbus Day or Indigenous Peoples Day uh, was called at that time. And it was also a, a, a new project that try to look at the uh, interactions or relations between Spain and Latin America in a different way. And, and uh, not, I think not by chance, we have today the same problems that we have probably in the United States. I think probably the, the example that you were putting in Mexico, but in Spain, there is also a very uh, intense debate about, about the same questions, right? About the, what to do with some statues. And one of the um, central, probably question is that the Columbus Day is still like, a, well, it was uh, from 1987 and particularly from the late 1990s, uh, it was the, the day of the nation, which is very problematic for many different reasons. And there is a debate about that also in Spain that is, I think, of a different nature, but I think also brings different, how you were speaking, like uh, the compromise, right? And the partial solutions that at certain moments uh, make possible to, to place uh, these statues in a moment of change. And now we have these new questions about what to do, right? I think your question, your last question after the talk was very important, right? Well, what, this what to do with these statues, I think is also a question about what is happening now in terms of, you know, this uh, uh, epochal or historical change, right? Hmm. And I don't know if there are other questions. Maybe you just said, like, maybe in uh, the well, chat. Just, uh, Mar yeah, Laura. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to mention one thing. Um, when I, I come from the province of Cadiz, and uh, when you go to Cadiz, um, people tell you, will tell you in the streets, this street is where Columbus came in chains to go to jail. You know, the people mm. remember that. Maybe they could uh, uh, 
I mean, they don't think greatly of Columbus there. They think of him as another person uh, that had to do with the, you know, with the um, colonization. But uh, they think of him as somebody that didn't do so well and that actually had to be put in jail. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. In Spain, you have that diversity of uh, looks uh, about Columbus. Totally. Right. Uh, yeah, Lowell, I think you, you were. I, that. I, I thought that your, the story about uh, the tearing down of the statue in San Cristobal de las Casas just two years before the Chiapas uh, rebellion, kind of foreshadowing what was going to come is, is really interesting. Would you have any reflections or speculations about? But this moment now that we're so consumed by, about how we remember the past, what does that tell us about what we expect the, in, in the next few years? Um, how, how does this play out? Uh, you don't have a crystal ball more than anyone else, but you know, a foreshadowing experience and so mm. it's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, that's that's a, a very interesting point because, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you might be aware of this, uh, Lowell, but but um, a few days ago there was a new communique by the Zapatista army, no, by the Neo Zapatista army. It's a very long and very interesting document that I recommend everyone to uh, who's who's interested to 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 to, to read. And the Zapatistas at this stage is clear that they're engaged in a very different moment that to my mind, and, and, and this is inspired by your comment. And I think it's possible to see it again, again as laying out the ground for sort of the struggle to come. And in, in, this, in, this, do, in this new communique that was just published, as I said last week or a few days ago, uh, it was clearly written by by Galeano, no, by the ex subcomandante Marcos, and he says something very, very striking. And he says that 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 Spain and the Spanish crown or the, or the Spanish state has nothing, doesn't have any reason to apologize. He says they say no, which for me kind of bellies a little bit the type of images we saw uh, two years prior to the to the, uh, the rebellion of 1994. And the, the, the Zapatista communique really places its attention on the current nation state and the current government and their sort of modernizing projects in the south of the country that to them just is just yet another uh, form of state intervention that is gonna undermine indigenous communities, right? So in a way they're reading through this moment and, and, and reading beyond the sort of revisionist or, or yeah, this revisionist sort of calls to, for instance, have the Spanish state you know, uh, ask for forgiveness for colonization. And they're saying, no, no, the real problem is the, is the current Mexican government in, the, in their case, in their view, right? So I wonder if that's something you could say that we that we we could expect that after the sort of moment of historical revision and historical reflection, we realize that the actual um, how to say it like the things that are actually threatening the common good and life and especially indigenous communities are not. Uh, events take, to, that took place five centuries ago, but rather very, very contemporary uh, events, forms of state violence, forms of state intervention mm. in, 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 um, in response to yet another pro, pro, program of modernization, uh, et cetera. No? So th maybe that's a direction. Mm. Good. I, uh, there's uh, another... There's uh, there is a question. No, I think it's a link. Or... Ah, it's a link. But Thank yeah, you. no, I think uh -huh. as, what you were saying, I think is very interesting. And from what, from what, when we see like uh, uh, the, in Mexico, for instance, you were speaking about, about this 
uh, new visions about seeing the problem more in this, this if I understood well, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, uh, to see the problem more in the, in the state of Mexico than in what it was like the colonial past, right? Is, is to see Mexico exactly. and the state. Is for instance, when we read for some of the uh, writers, indigenous writers in Mexico, like uh, uh, Jasnaya Elena Aguilar, for instance, who is a, a known writer. She's a linguist, but she speaks a lot about right, intellectual in Mexico. And for her, when, when you read her, is very, mm, she's very always like a pointing to the state of Mexico. She doesn't care too much about Spain, the colonial past, the monarchy. Mm -hmm. This is sort of like, of course, there was this colonial past and but the problem is how the Mexican state uh, took like uh, these uh, legacies and how we are struggling today as indigenous nations because they they claim to be a nation, right? Like uh, at least to have the right mm -hmm. not to be just recognized for their language and for their culture, but also as nations and to have some rights in terms of like uh, of like uh, the political debates when they have all these problems that are in Mexico or everywhere else in, in Latin America about extractivism and extractivism. Many, many other problems that are facing that, that are current problems, right? In, in, in yeah. indigenous communities, right? Yeah, yeah. just, uh, I mean, uh, sorry to, to intervene again, but uh, just to say that today I read that there was a new study that shows the effects of mining, mining, uh, practices in the Amazon and the absolute threat they pose on the lives of uh, indigenous peoples in the Amazon. And this effect is incomparable, right, to, to any sort of uh, revisionist vindication around Iberian expansionism. I mean, what, I'm, what I think is that the challenges and, and, and the, the risks uh, faced by indigenous peoples throughout the continent are much more have much more to do with 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 extractivism as you were saying miguel and with current state and political uh and, and policies than 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 really with with anything that that uh, that came before you know? so again that's one of those 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 difficult points because from a certain perspective, it's very easy to 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 go after the colonial colonial uh, history, you know, and and sort of the role of European powers in in the in the colonization is way less easy. Whereas it's way harder to really pinpoint what the actual th threats are today, you know, and where they come from. Totally. Yeah. I think Raul, you wanna, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, David, thank you for, for your talk. Um, I have like some, some comments regarding the, the symbols of, of, of Christopher Columbus monuments, statues, and the way they are somehow connected with the protests that we had just a few months ago in the context of Black Lives Matter and the situation where, <laughs> Hi. And the situation where, <laughs> where, the, where, where they were very much connected and tied with, with racism and colonialism in, in a way that for me, it's, it's quite interesting while you were talking about the context of Los Zapatistas and kind of moving forward to a more specific situation of being uh, against specific policies of, of Mexican state currently with Andres Manuel López Obrador. The, the, the Zapatistas, from my perspective, they haven't get rid of the discourse of colonialism, but also the other key word in their discourse is neoliberalism. So when Juan mm -hmm. de Marcos is writing about the differences between of the ones who live in, in, in the bottom of the line in, 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 in Mexico and, and the ones who live in the top roof penthouses like the Slims and the Ascargas, it's, it's a very interesting way to connect neoliberal policies with a constant colonial violence that has been taking shape, shape on different ways. Huh? So you're describing mm -hmm. that, um, the, in, the, the extraction industries and Proyecto del Tren Maya in Mexico that threatens the, the, the indigenous communities in the southeast of Mexico. So what, what I see more is like a neocolonial project of uh, 
threatening the autonomy, the decisions, the, the, the kind of rights that indigenous communities have been trying to, to keep, to resist, to, to, to promote during more than 500 years. So I, I'm very sure if we, if we can somehow get rid of that kind of colonial repressive violence from, from those statues that, that it's still very freshly alive in the protesters that are removing those statues, the yeah. protesters that are like, taking down the Masariego statues in, in, in 1992 that you were describing the photo. Mm -hmm. uh, feminist movements like kind of putting their, their uh, specific uh, graffiti on, on, on several monuments of this nature. Uh, kind of claiming a patriarchal order society. So in, in, a, in a different way, it's, it's interesting to see how different movements right now, the feminist movements, the black life movements, indigenous movements are kind of approaching to these symbols and to these statues because they have like different meanings to their histories yeah. in that way. So for the feminists, it means like a patriarchal order society, capitalistic uh, project uh, for indigenous communities, right. colonialism and the 500 years of exploitation or more than 500 years of current exploitation narratives. Uh, for the Black Lives Matter, the colonial systemic violence that it's still um, very present in some specific bodies of, of African Americans, of peoples of color, of indigenous movements. So in, in that way, it's, it's for me very obvious from the perspective of these groups that the colonial violence is still there, but taking like different forms. I don't know, how do you... Mm. Yeah, that? no, I, I absolutely agree. I think the, 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 the another way in which monuments are over the terming, over the terming in, the, in their meaning is precisely as, as, as synecdoches, right, of this larger genealogies that, for instance, tie, as you say, neoliberalism to colonial uh, European um, colonialism and uh, I in that sense I think they are inevitable and they are a part of this process of of uh, of trying to, to move beyond to those types of legacies of of uh, colonialism and and yet let me just read you something that I find absolutely intriguing in this in this communique by by the Zapatistas that someone just posted in the in the chat and it's a, it's a fascinating uh, quote, no? It says, uh, and sorry that I'll read it in Spanish. Ni el Estado Español ni la Iglesia Católica tiene que pedirnos perdón de nada. No nos hacemos eco de los farsantes que se montan sobre nuestra sangre y así esconden que tienen las manos manchadas de ella. ¿De qué nos va a pedir perdón España? No? Uh, so, so once again, I think, I think as you say, the, there is a, a, a clear genealogy of, of, uh, of extractivism that goes back to, to, the, to the colonial period. But in this case, I see the Zapatistas as, as trying to break away from a certain logic of what we would call in Spanish revanchismo, right? That they see especially embodied in the figure of uh, the current Mexican president, for example. So yeah, I don't know exactly where whether I'm I'm really addressing your your observation, but I but I but, but I, I agree that that these monuments come to real to to represent wider much wider phenomena, and in that sense, they're also sort of valid takes on the meaning of 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 them. No. So thank you for your comment. No, it was a very good point, and I think yeah, I mean when when. Uh... Yeah, all these questions that Raul uh, brought, I think is, are very important because on the one hand, as we, as we were saying, we see that there is this reconfiguration in which maybe the colonial past uh, doesn't mean too much to explain what is happening with this status. On the other hand, we see that uh, when you were speaking, Raul, about, about the different meanings, right, that this status have, for instance, for an indigenous community, for from the perspective of feminism, for instance, as seen always a masculine figure representing modernity, uh, invention, and so on. So I think it's uh, always uh, a question of 
a politics of memory more than history and how as we were speaking at the beginning right about how people experience some figures that have a finally a symbolic value so it's more about this i would say probably than about history and of course this is in a certain way related to something that begins with Columbus, Iberian expansion, early modern colonialism, imperialism, all these like a big, and, and we can add, as you were saying, like capitalism and then, and then neoliberalism. So there are a lot of a word in there that are hard to manage, but through this, through this like, uh, uh, statues and figures of the colonial period like uh, I think we have something that is like a, a, a way to address some social claims today right and and you David you were saying and uh, it was very interesting about the pedestal uh, what, what we do after we remove the statue uh, can we just like uh, okay we place them in the in the museum but finally I would say probably the uh, the claims will still be there right about what to do, how how to uh, recreate a different way of uh, regenerating a symbolism that will bring people together or, or will uh, or at least as you were saying at the beginning will bring a partial solution a compromise for the kind of like a, of, for, for the kind of like a social struggle that we live together, like that you, we live today, right? I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Miguel, you said something that sparked my attention. Yeah, Laura. Um, yeah, when you talk about politics and memory and history, I know that, you know, the transition in Spain has dealt with those topics as well. And something that, um, you know, it's at stake is not only what is remembered, but what is at stake in the remembrance, right? So okay. if we, if we the, I agree that a colon might be a small nugget in the whole history, but by making colon, by taking that, putting that pedestal out, you know, or not, um, the conversation remains around colon yes, colon no, right? Totally. And maybe then I, I will never go to knock at status on the street, but I agree with what people is doing because uh, in a sense, it's not about colon yes, colon no, is let's talk about something else. I know that Antonio Elorza in El País, you know, the Spaniard uh, political scientist, also makes, um, makes a claim about that, you know, what our America, what type of America are we talking about today? You know, because the, the, the politics of memory in the New York of businessman and underdog Italian Americans are not the politics of memory today, you know? So that will be something I, 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 I will think of. Yeah, totally. Yeah, sure. And I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's as you were saying, I mean, maybe, and I totally agree with that. I mean, uh, I think something that when we saw the last uh, moment of iconoclasm this summer in the context of uh, Black Lives Matter and then in Europe and other countries, I think we, the reaction often in, in newspapers, in the, at least in the more conservative is to recreate a sort of like a old narratives about vandalism, mm -hmm. uh, uh, these savages in France, they spoke a lot about uh, en sauvagerie or always you have this idea of what is civilized and what is not. And I totally agree with you when you say like, uh, uh, probably even if we are not gonna go to the, to the fight, right? To, to try to pull down the statue, we understand that this is happening because people need to express something and people need to, uh, to maybe uh, address a problem that is now in society, and, and it is very hard, of course, to 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 uh, understand or or to give sense to to what is exactly uh, being redefined through this social protest. To me, uh, after like uh, one thing, sorry, yeah, so, I, Laura. But one thing, what I was thinking is that Colon himself, the historical Colon committed much gruesome acts of savagery, you know, that 
part of this is what Mercedes was talking out about that he ended up in jail, you know, because even for the standards of his day, what he was doing was savage, you know. Mm. You know, just to follow up on this very good point about one of the current states of this discussion about memory, and it brings up what Carlos was saying earlier regarding this enormous statue of Cologne in, in Puerto Rico, uh, because, of course, the, the Puerto Ricans will, will vote on whether or not they want to maintain their current uh, status or become a state. Um, and if they do request to become a state, and because we are embroiled in a current political battle regarding not wanting the Puerto Ricans to come in as a state because then they'll maybe add two Democratic senators to our Senate and it gets involved in our contemporary American uh, politics. That means that we would prefer to remain a colonial power uh, that that we favor the Puerto Rican status uh, as, as a colony. Um, and, and we just think in our own American history, when, when we had the Spanish-American War and we took it, we weren't bashful about taking it over. We were very proud of this, just like the Spanish were proud of, of their empire. Uh, so, so then some people assume that by calling us colonialists, that's a shaming uh, and, instead of recognizing that we rather like being colonialists. Uh, and, and this is... <laughs> It's a thing to shy away from, but it just raises of, of the contemporary issues about what's at stake in in memories and, and how to put up statues and what they mean for us. So I, 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 I mean, I I totally agree with with uh, with what you, with, uh, Lowell was saying. I uh, I think the question of colonialism is also important to remember. It's not a question of the 16th and 17th century. It's a, very, it's a question that is very open today, not only in the case, of course, of Puerto Rico, arguably also in the Middle East, as we all know. And, uh, and then there's, of course, also the question of internal, intranational colonialism, right? As, or colonialism, internal colonialism as a form of nation building uh, throughout the world. And, and for me, insofar as we, I mean, insofar, the, the, the tearing down of statues and, and sort of the rebuking of, of the rebuke of this, of this legacy is, 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 is um, constructive insofar as it then leads to us questioning also the status of contemporary forms of coloniality and extractivism, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, maybe, I don't know if someone wanna make a last comment or question no okay so thank you very much david thank you everyone for for joining us today it was a great conversation i was i am very happy to to have been discussing with you this important matter i think so thank you david okay. Un aplauso. Thank you. Gracias.